very much indeed. It's some time since I came here with Greg Clark, the then Secretary of State for the um, Department of Communities and Local Government, to try and find a devolution deal that would create a, an all-embracing authority to deal with the opportunities of this remarkable part of the world. Um, I've been out of touch, frankly, and then out of government when I was sacked. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's an immensely flattering invitation to come here and catch up. Peter made the point about the remarkable success. And there's no way to stop the success of Cambridge. It is a world-class, intellectually generating ideas initiative, and it will continue to do so. Um, the job of government is to try and enable it to do so as effectively as possible, and to spread the benefits of it within what is a defined local economy. That helps the centre of the economy because it draws in resources, it provides facilities in terms of housing, it spreads the wealth which enhances the democratic acceptability of change. So looking at a sort of a downward view of the country as a whole, looking at what the economy actually is and how far it spreads and how much of an area it dominates is a very important part of the government's responsibility to work out how best to manage success or combat failure. Now, it so happens that my political career started with, uh, in the 1960s with the publication of a report by Redcliffe Maud analyzing what local administration should be to most effectively manage the diverse local economies that make up the United Kingdom. And he came and recommended a proposal to create about 60 unitary authorities, uh, as opposed to the 1,400 authorities we had at the time. No criticism of the fact there were 1,400 authorities because they were designed to cope with a world where if you wanted to get somewhere, you either walked or got on a horse. No, that's the truth of it. And so it was quite right that historically these very large numbers of authorities emerged to serve the capacity of society and the ambitions of society. You walked or you got on a horse. That's all you could do. But by the time I became in politics in 1966, we did have a motor car and trains and all sorts of things that it facilitated. And today, of course, we have, everybody has one of these. And so the whole pressure and opportunity has been transformed, but not local government. And so when I prepared my notes for today, the first on the area, oh, uh, sorry, the first at the head of my notes was area. Now, what is the local Cambridge economy? Well, uh, I go back to the time I came here with Greg, and we know perfectly well, everybody knows what the Cambridge economy is about. It embraces significant parts of uh, uh, Cambridgeshire, obviously all Cambridgeshire. It embraces significant parts of Suffolk and Norfolk and Essex. And then you've got the uh, uh, initiative which I was involved with, with the um, National Infrastructure Commission of the corridor to Oxford. Uh, you've got a corridor to Stansted. You've got a corridor to Norfolk. And uh, that's the economy. People look centrally to Cambridge from that corridor. They see their economic prospects largely associated with that model. And people travel to work, have supply chains, have homes, whatever it may be, that is this area. So what have we got? 
we have a mayoral authority, including Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, so a lozenge in the middle. We have a city deal, which we're here to talk about today, which embraces the city of Cambridge. We have a local enterprise partnership, <coughs> which embraces Rutland, Norfolk, Suffolk, bits of Essex, North Hertfordshire, Cambridgeshire, and Peterborough itself. Uh, if I go through it, there's one mayoral authority, a city deal for Cambridge, a local enterprise partnership embracing the whole area. We then have a unitary authority in Peterborough. We have a county council in Cambridgeshire, various other county councils round about. We have five district councils within Cambridgeshire, and we have eight other district councils outside. And then we have the various corridors that I have mentioned, three corridors. They've all got their own staff, they've all got their own people, they've all got their own leader, and you're all practical business people. Imagine running your business with that spider's web of power to which you had to account. It's mad. It's indefensible. It is so out of date and out of touch with the real challenges that exist in this area. And it's the fault of government. Now, uh, you could say quite rightly, well, you were there for a long time. <laughs> Why didn't you do something about it? And, and, and I have to stand up and say I didn't do that much about it because the politics of the time wouldn't let me. And they still won't because there are endless people with their stake in society, many of them called councillors, who will defend their power base to the last gasp of their existence. And lots of them have powerful relationships with the House of Commons. There are large numbers of constituency MPs who see the district councils as part of their power structure. And all of these things, and everybody protects their jobs, everybody protects their self-interest, we all know that. But as people who depend upon the success of the local economy, you do need to understand that spider's web of power which enmeshes all that happens economically in this area. It is not a formula for success. And if you wanted to look at our great competitors across the world, they don't have it. Germany has a massive regional structure of power and decision making. America have their states. France have their great departments. We are the only country that has this complexity of power sharing. And then above it, the functional divisions of Whitehall that are in many ways responsible for the inability for governments to act. You do not have place-making, place-building, economic-inspired decision-making. I have been, in some ways, at the forefront of the devolution agenda, because although I have the most profound admiration for the British Civil Service, given that they carry out their jobs as the job is defined, with great skill and integrity and in an incorruptible way. The fact is they are housing people, they are transport people, they are social affairs people, they are a whole range of different functions. What they are not is thinking about Cambridgeshire. And so you have this spider's web with functional inputs. And what I believe in profoundly is creating log local organizations where the people who actually live and eat and breathe and dream uh, the, the reality of an economy have power to make decisions about it. Hence my belief that this spider's web needs urgent examination and much reform. Um, my next, um, my own preference is clear you need a directly elected mayor for the economy and uh, unitary subdivisions within it, which would reduce the number of authorities very, very significantly. Now, just going through the other key things, 
once you have a unitary authority, and of course in the context of today, I would have to say that the city deal is a substitute for that. It's not an adequate substitute because it's so limited in its uh, geography. But the first thing you have to do locally is a SWOT analysis. All of you know about SWOT analysis. The first thing you do, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. And you have to do it with integrity. You have to be prepared to say, no, we're not very good here and we must do better. And doing better means change, and mean, change means probably me. Um, but you have to do it if you're going to be in the competitive world. So the first step after devolution is a strength and weaknesses, opportunity, threat process. The next step to me is a plan. Now, I, I first became convinced of the need for a plan in Hokkaido, not a word perhaps as well known here as it is in Japan, because Japan is the northern part of Japan. A Hokkaido is the northern part of Japan. And frankly, you wouldn't actually volunteer to go and live there, because from November to March, it's under <coughs> permafrost. It's frozen. It's that cold. But in the mid-80s, I met the mayor. And some people would have locked him up as a madman, because he was hugely energetic and dynamic, and he had millions of presentations as to what he was going to do. And what he was going to do was to turn Hokkaido into a world city by about now. Now, I've never been back to find out what he did. <laughs> but, but the fact is that this was a dynamic guy who had got all these projects, and half of them wouldn't work. All of you've got projects, half of which won't work. But you know you have to have a number of attempts in order to get a percentage of success. And this guy had got all these projects, and I will bet some of them were successful. <coughs> but what I also knew about him is that every time he said, finish, done work, he'd put something else in its place. And that is what you have to do if you are going to drive success in any business endeavor or any public sector operation. You have to be constantly on the move, updating, going for it. So when I have done reports, I did one for Liverpool, I did one for the Tees Valley, the first thing that one does is to sit here and say, what do you think? Because you know, you see, I don't. One of the weaknesses of my position, which I will frankly admit, is here I am in Cambridgeshire telling you about the opportunity for Cambridgeshire, and you would be perfectly entitled to get up and say, you don't know the first thing about <coughs> Cambridgeshire. You'd be right. I don't. So why have me? Be because there is a sort of feeling that there's a divine wi wisdom, there's an infinite experience. Bringing someone in will tell you how to do it. It won't. You know what to do. And collectively, if I sat here for a day, you would tell me what needs doing. I don't know what it would be, but it may be you want more control over the skills agenda. You maybe want to bypass. Maybe you wanted um, there's a school you think should be improved. Maybe you want productivity, which country's not very good at. I'd ask you how to do it. But out of Talking to local people in the public and the private sector would come an agenda. That's the next task, is to create an agenda. Within the agenda, I think you need a growth hub, uh, not just <laughs> the narrow confines of the city, because a huge number of people who are part of this economy don't live in the city, even if they work in the city. But the growth of small businesses and the expansion from small startups to medium sized companies is a pretty lonely and fraught experience. I know, I've been there. Advice other countries provide the most fantastic range of support services. The continent, the Chambers, America, the Federation of Small. Uh, the Small Business Administration, MITI in Japan. We have an amateur range of services, and we have war, turf war 
between the industrial representative groups of the CBI and the Chambers of Commerce and the Engineering Employees Federation Institute Directors, uh, they're all seeking for their own status and they do not come together and provide the quality of service. And if you take those tribes and you add their membership together, they usually have about 20% of the businesses in the local economy. Now, there will be some of the bigger businesses, of course, more than 20%. There will be excellent businesses, because excellent businesses are up to speed, and they want to export, and they want to know what's going on, and they therefore participate. But the problem with this country is not excellence. We've got plenty of that, and around here you've got it in spades. The problem is the other end, the underperformers the ones who don't even think about exporting, let alone trying to do it, the ones whose productivity drag us down to a level which is way behind our international competitors, those are the ones you've got to get at. And providing them with the services of a first-class support system to a one-stop shop called a growth hub is very important. So have you got a first-class growth hub? It needs to be online. It needs to have central meeting facilities so you can encourage people to come and talk and understand and ask questions of their mentors and that sort of thing. You should publish an annual report saying what you intend to achieve and a year later whether you achieved it. So discipline is important. And uh, you should be prepared to be more aggressive to governments. There is a deference built into the culture of our country. I hear it time and time again. What would they think? No matter what they think, it's what you think and how energetic you are in saying what you think and pressing. The fact is, the creaking wheel is the one that gets the oil. And so people simply saying, well, we mustn't upset them. You know what it is, oh boy. That's completely the reverse case. The people who make the pressure make the light. and. Uh, so uh, my, my advice to you, we need a peasant's revolt. <laughs> Be part of it. Thank you.